Let's open our Bibles to Luke 21. As you turn to Luke 21, it's a reminder from the Lord Jesus Christ himself that there are fearful times coming to our planet. Now, most of us Americans, uh, it's amazing. If you read American news and you look at international news, I'm talking about the national papers of the major industrialized nations of the world, our news is so myopic, and so we, we kind of are always, you know, putting news out about ourselves. A lot of times their news so differs from ours because they're looking at the whole world. And we usually look at ourselves because we think we're the whole world, I guess. I don't know. But this week, it almost I don't think I saw any major newspapers record this week's events of a global proportion. I know we had the Iraq stuff and we had, you know, the... Saudi Arabia stuff. We didn't have global things. Luke 21 is a reminder from Jesus Christ that bad times are coming. And every time something that's in Luke 21 happens, Jesus said it should cause us to lift up our heads. Actually, the the Greek words means to actually to turn your body and to cause your whole body to focus upward. So one of those events happened this week. Did you know that this week was the greatest recorded ever in history of the planet explosion from the surface of our sun that headed toward the earth? It is absolutely the largest recorded explosion ever found anywhere in our solar system. I mean, it was massive. I saw the pictures of it. I mean, it didn't even make our papers. And that, thankfully, is because it exploded away from us. If it had gone toward us, probably your cell phone would have gone off, or even worse than that would have happened if it had come to the earth. Now, that's exactly what Luke 21 talks about, and I'm going to share that with you this morning, starting in verse 25. Because Jesus says, we are headed toward days when people, and I love the color of the Greek language, when people expire, that Greek word, apopsuko. Now, you probably got the pop part, and maybe you know what the suko means, spirit, or the, the, uh, the suke, the soul of the person. But it says their soul pops out. Isn't that a graphic word? I mean, it says people, look at verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity and the seas. Uh, waves are roaring, verse 26. And men's, that's, it doesn't mean males, it means humanity. That word is uh, the, the idea of humanity, of people. People's hearts, a popsuko, pop out. They're, they're actually, their breath, it says, pops out of them and they expire. Why? Why is this going to happen? Because of fear. It says their hearts fail them from or because of Fear, fearful things. And actually, it it even goes on to say, because of the fearful things which are coming. And that, I mean, I was, every one of these words is a, is a unique word choice by the Holy Spirit. It says, they see them marching toward them and their spirits pop out of them. They're so afraid. It's not like it happens and they're afraid afterward. It's coming toward them and they just die of fear. Now, you know, when hurricanes come and earthquakes and even the California fires, there were several deaths in every one of those events because people were afraid and they had heart attacks. But this is not the, the people that are in their 80s who already have a, you know, not a bad ticker. We're talking about healthy people who see the events Jesus talks about and it scares them. Well, the ultimate panic attack is coming on many healthy humans and they will just expire for fear. And, you know, this past Tuesday, we got a little taste of things to come. Let me read to you about it since it wasn't in the papers. For the past seven days, scientists all over the world have been glued to their seats. They've been watching the weather in space. This past Tuesday, they sat up in their chairs, they rubbed their eyes, and they started to sweat because they wondered what was going to happen. They watched the sun bulge. They watch the buildup of the energy and then the eruption of our sun. Had it been facing the earth, the eruption, we would have sweated too. Thankfully, it went five days ago the other direction. The largest solar eruption ever seen measuring on the Richter scale of the sun a 28. 
on the solar Richter scale, exploded from the surface of the sun and headed out across the solar system away from the earth. This week, the earth witnessed the greatest solar event ever measured. The sun exploded a cloud of superheated gas equivalent to a million hydrogen bombs all exploding at once in one small area, and it just went out from the surface of the sun. In fact, it would make a beautiful painting or picture on your wall. It's so beautiful the way it went off. Good thing it didn't come this way. Those who know it say that everyone on earth would have known something had happened if it had headed our way. The sun erupts all the time. But it erupted three times in 24 hours, bringing the number of major eruptions to nine in less than a space of two weeks. Now, I'm not talking about the sun's just like a cauldron boiling. It's just a giant atomic bomb going off all the time. But every so often, sunspots form, and these sunspots cause an uh, uh, electromagnetic buildup between the sunspot and the surface. As you know, the sun's top is slow, and the bottom layers are going real fast. It's almost like a giant generator, the way it runs, the way that, that the Lord built this thing. And so it's spinning fast underneath and slow on the surface, and electrical uh, magnetic forces build up. And when a sunspot sparks on the surface, it almost catches the charge, and it begins bulging like this, and then a solar flare is when it has an eruption, and it just, it just spurts out from the side of the sun. You say, well, how do we know it's big? Well, ever since 1755, when the British perfected in their solar observatory a telescope that could observe the sun, there has been a daily measuring record of the sun since 1755. I mean, almost 300 years. They've been charting sunspots and flares and everything else. This is what... The scientists who have studied this and looked at the data said, there has never been a string of activity like the last 10 days. Now, I said that it was a 28 on the Richter scale. In uh, March 13th of 1989, a solar eruption measuring 15 hit the Earth. And if you remember anything about the news of, of uh, March 13th, 1989, the whole province of Quebec their power grid was fried by that solar flare. That's just where it hit. And six million people had no power, and they had to go out and completely repair the the severed and and fried connections. That was a 15 on the scale. Ten years later, on May 19, 1998, a flare half that size, only an 8, knocked out the Galaxy 4. Now, I remember that one because I was at QT when it happened. And you know what happened? Or, I mean, I wasn't at, oh, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't at QT. I was at Get and Go because Get and Go was just starting those ATM machines that they were omnipresent there. And I remember the ATM machine, as I was standing at the counter, started having white papers come out of it. I thought, that's really cute. They just started coming out like that. Not money. White papers. And they were going like this. And the the clerk went over and he said, well, you know, tapping it and everything. And at that same instant, any of you that had pagers remember... Your pagers went off just like that. 45 million pagers and ATM machines absolutely stopped dead in their tracks because of a seven on the Richter scale wave of energy that went out. And it totally destroyed a $250 million satellite. It just just went by it, and it's gone. It's just out there floating around dead. This thing was four times bigger. They said they don't even have measurements on their scales that go that high. And they said they didn't even get to see the fullness of it because as the sun uh, turned, it just exploded off into that direction, almost like the Lord just didn't give it to us. Well, look back at what Jesus says in verse 25, because there shall be signs in the sun, he said. Early on Monday morning of this past week, a week ago tomorrow, Paul Brecke, the deputy director of the SOHO spacecraft, that's the, the big solar orbiting uh, uh, heliosphere study uh, observatory, which looks at the sun, was digesting just the, the huge eruptions that had occurred up through Monday. This thing happened Tuesday of this week. And this is what he said. He said, this is, this is an unbeliever, this is a scientist, this is not Hal Lindsey talking. He said this, I think last week we'll go into the history books of this planet as the most dramatic period of solar history ever seen. That's what he said on Monday. On Tuesday. I mean, just, 
In fact, he hasn't issued a statement since then. But let me assess this for you, okay? Scientists now know that, that all of this is a cycle. There's an 11-year cycle of, of events in the sun. Sunspot activity, solar flares, everything for 21 11-year cycles has been recorded by solar observatories since 1755. So they've had 21 11-year cycles. And they say, oh, the sun goes... It just has this nice little pattern. Okay, so that's great. But the problem is we're three years beyond what has happened for 300 years. The sun gets real flary, and then it gets real quiet. We are down on this quiet side three years into the lessening. And the problem is the sun is ramping up like it never has before in history. That's what Mr. Brecka says. He said that on March 6th of this year, the largest sunspot ever seen developed. This unusual spot created solar x-rays, gamma rays, protons, surging waves of solar wind that disturbed our magnetic fields. You probably heard about that. All of the aurora borealis was out there and people were seeing it. But scientists say that this is harmless to human beings as long as it doesn't blow our way. And it only affects most of us sporadically. And so he said it was a non-event until Tuesday morning. But in spiritual terms, we see that we're in another ball game. Richard Wilson, the researcher with NASA that's analyzing this, said that historic records of solar activity indicate solar radiation has increased since the 19th century. If the trend continues, he says, we will have the most significant change in our weather. Now, any of you that love to study stuff, did you know that, that there was a little ice age in the 17th century? There was a period of time when there was no solar activity, and actually the channel in the area around Britain began to freeze. Now, I mean, you think about, I mean, they, that's why they call it the, the Little Ice Age. They thought another ice age was coming on the Earth because for 40 years there was no sunspot activity. That's what causes our atmosphere to warm, that constant bombardment of solar radiation. And so in the 1640s, they observed that it decreased so much that a little ice age occurred, and it just got northern Europe couldn't grow crops. It wasn't long enough, and there was actually a severe time of, of starvation that came this way. And then things started heating up and going the other way. But look what Jesus says, and this is what I want to get to. Verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know its desolation is near. Then he gives an AD 70 deal and tells them, watch out, and that happened. Then he says this, at the end of verse 24, Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the Gentiles are fulfilled. That's when we are right now. Jerusalem is no longer Jewish uh, worship going on as they did. It's trampled by Gentiles. Okay. In fact, Revelation 11 says there'd be an uh, abomination up on the Temple Mountain. There is. It's, it's the Dome of the Rock. And then look at verse 25. Look at this. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. Jesus spoke of wars and rumors of wars. He spoke of famines. He spoke of earthquakes. He spoke of pestilence. He spoke of climate uh, change. He spoke of ever-increasing scale. He spoke of Israel as a literal place in the last days. He spoke of Jerusalem's rise to global prominence. But then he says this in verse 25. He says, by the way, everything I just said sounds like headlines, right? I mean, Jerusalem's, uh, Jerusalem has the second or the third largest press corps in the world. Why? Jerusalem, I mean, it's less than a million people. Why do they have more reporters there than anywhere except New York City and Washington, D.C.? Why? Because the whole world's fascinated with Israel. Why? Because they don't like them. They're, they're afraid of them. They're disproportionate in their influence and in their, in their attention. And so he said, he, it sounds like the headlines, but look what he says in verse 25. But when there are signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nation and the sea's waves roaring, look what he says. He says, when all that happens, verse 28, and I have this in bright red in my Bible. Now when these things begin to happen, that's why I love every time there's a major catastrophic solar event, a huge earthquake or something like that. Yes, I mean, my heart grieves for all those who go into eternity without knowing Christ. But every time one of those events happen, I think of verse 28, just, that's why I have it in fluorescent pink in my Bible. When these things begin to happen, look up 
and lift up your heads. Remember, it's two separate Greek words. It's not only lift your eyes, it's turn your whole body because your redemption draws near. And every time there are signs in the sun, signs in the moon, in the stars, on the earth, verse 25, when the nations are in distress, and verse 26, when fear and a, the panic attack hits the planet, we should look up because Jesus said, your redemption draws near. Before those things are going to hit, he says, I want you to look up because your redemption comes. Now, continuing to read, so likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, look at verse 32, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation, Luke 21, 32, shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now, you can't say it any more plainly than that. Here's what I like to say. Now, think about this. When you look out and you see Christmas decorations, you know that Thanksgiving is close. (laughs) Right? That's true. He says, when you see these things happening, the birth pangs for the end of life on planet Earth as we know it, lift up your head because you're a redemption. Is very near. That's his promise to us. Well, we should think about that because we live in fearful times. And God has offered to those who live in fearful times, more than any other prohibition, God has offered to us a call. And he says this, fear not. Fear not. Fear not when, when in these solar things happen, when earthquakes happen. I mean, 911 was, a, I hope, a wake-up call to us that it's coming right to our shore. It's coming right to our place where we live. And God gives us repeated calls not to fear. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And this morning, God's word challenges us to live a word-filled life, listen, even in fearful times. That's the time we should live at the most. That's the time that we should be confident that we know him. Because fear is not from God. Fear comes from our flesh. It surrounds us in the world, and it's from the realm of the devil. Fear is not part of our life. That's why God says, most repeated negative prohibition, fear not. God says, I don't want you trafficking in fear. The Lord wants us not to fear. We live in a world that's possessed by fear. People are afraid of death, and there's a fear of even life, and there's a fear of of danger lurking. There's a fear of knowing the truth. I mean, I was standing next to someone this week, and and, uh, I was about to give my order, and they looked at me, this clerk looked at me, and they looked me right in the eye, and they said, I know what you want, and they told me what I wanted. I said, how did you know that? They said, I'm a psychic. (laughs) They shouldn't have said that to me because I looked at them back, and I said, are you serious? You're psychic? They said, yes. I said, I'm sorry for you. And they looked at me and I said, you're going to have a bad ending. And they, you know, they didn't know where I was coming from. I said, the word of, I said, the psychic realm is from the devil. And I said, and if that's what you are, you, God says, are going to have a bad ending. I made connection and boy, their eyes got wide (laughs) and they turned and looked at me and they said, and you are wrong. And the person behind me was, uh, a charismatic evangelist (laughs) and pulled me aside and said, don't you know that woman is a practicing witch? I said, well, I found out, didn't I? When confronted with the word of God, I mean, she was really smiley until I said, God says, and her eyes just got hard and wide and she looked at me and said, you are wrong. See, we live in a world with darkness and God says, fear not. And he said that we are to live in constant touch with the God of heaven so that no matter what happens, we can walk in boldness. In this lifestyle, which I call the the word-filled life, Paul describes in Ephesians 5 as a spirit-filled life, Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. It's basically the offer of God, his presence and his influence to permeate our life. That's what a word-filled life is. It means letting God totally take control of us. Kind of like that psychic has let the devil do to her. Only in a positive, supernatural sense, God wants to utterly possess, to use biblical words, our reins, the center of our being. Now, 
we've already seen that this unbroken line of communication, uh, this word-filled life, works even when we're in distracting times. That's what we saw from Enoch and Noah and Abraham. They were distracted. Job change, move, and all that, and the world falling apart. So they were distracted. Then we saw from Moses that it works in busy times when you're at the height of your activity. Well, this morning... I'd like to look with you at how you can have a word-filled life, not just in distracting times when you're moving and, and, you know, job changes, and not just when you're at the peak of your hum of activity in busy times, but in fearful times. So turn back with me, and our text is Joshua 1, 8 and 9. I want you to turn with me to Joshua 1. We're going to read it in just a moment, because we're going to see today in God's Word, in Joshua 1, that we can live a word-filled life in fearful times. As you turn to Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible, we're opening to the account that God himself recorded of him talking to a man named Joshua. Out in the hallway, I was talking to our choir members, and I said, did you realize when God spoke to Joshua, Joshua was 90 years old? And what we're going to read in a moment, God is commissioning him to be the head of God's armies on earth the nation of Israel. And he said, I want you to lead them, and no one can stand before you. I want you to go into a land of giants. I want you to go into a a land with walled cities whose walls, it says, reach up to the heavens. These huge fortified cities, millions of inhabitants, and I want you from your campground to launch an offensive against them with an untrained army, with uh, unhardened soldiers, probably ill-equipped, You know, it never even mentions the weaponry that these people had, the Israelites. And he said, I want you to go in and conquer this land. And that's the word we get in Joshua. Well, Joshua 1, I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read down to verse 9 and see if you catch the drift of what God says we are to do when we have fearful times. After the death of Moses, Joshua 1, 1, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. And he said, Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over the Jordan with all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I have said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea toward the going down the sun shall be your territory. Verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Does that ring a bell? That's Hebrews 13.5. Wow. Right there. Verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Why? Because it would be possible to be afraid facing what he was facing. So he says, be strong, be of good courage. For this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, he repeats himself, only be strong and be very courageous. Why? Because it would be easy to be afraid. That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Now the famous verse, we all know, verse 8. I wanted to read the context. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall... And you see how we got on this? Meditate. We're studying meditation, the word-filled life. You shall meditate in it day and night. Now, wait a minute. He was a soldier. He wasn't supposed to carry around a scroll. Can you imagine, you know, you know, sword, shield, scroll, you know? Can you imagine carrying or lugging one of those things around and trying to fight? No, he was supposed to meditate on it. He was supposed to get it off the pages and into his mind, into his heart, and he's supposed to be saying it day and night. In other words, he's supposed to be involved in scripture, memory, and meditation. Why? Continuing verse 8, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Why? For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Now, if you want to succeed in in business, if you want to succeed in in the arts, you want to succeed in anything, you can either pay $500 and go off to the seminars and have the hoop-de-doo people, you know, rev you up, or you can just learn to meditate on the scriptures. Because you will always succeed if God is with you and you are full of his word. But look at verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. That word dismayed means falling apart, means to be shattered. 
Don't let life and fear and trouble shatter you. Don't be dismayed. Don't lose heart. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, you are. This is your message. We are to have a word-filled life in fearful times. And whether the fear is of terrorists or of bioterrorism or of economic terrorism or if it's of cancer or of a stalker or of somebody out in the dark around our house or if it be of the future or if it be of a new job or whatever it is, we are to not fear. And I pray that we would see that your prescription for not fearing is meditation. It's a word-filled life. And when we meditate, we know that you are with us always to the end. So help us to have a word-filled life, even in fearful times. And help us to understand that reality. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, let me give you a quick bio of uh, old Joshua. Joshua, when Jesus was speaking to him, by the way, Jesus was the commander of the host of the Lord, and I'm not going to go into the whole book, that's chapter 3. But when the Lord God, the Son, came and spoke to him, he was 90 years old. And God called him at 90, after 40 years in prep school with Moses, he called him to lead the nation and do all this conquest stuff. When God speaks to Joshua, he gives him a promise, because the natural human response to what God asked Joshua to do would be fear. I mean, to lead three million people into a hostile territory and do frontal attacks on established armies and cities and walled towns. Can you imagine, I mean, with your bow and arrow going to a 40-foot high wall and saying, okay, we're going to take you guys, you know. Can you imagine, I mean, they don't have aerial bombardment and drones and they don't have M-16s. They have arrows and slingshots, you know, and spears. And, uh, and they're farmers and herdsmen. So, I mean, it was a fearful thing. And so God says, I don't want you to be dismayed, verse 9. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to know the Lord is with you. And the way you will experience that is verse 8, meditating, letting his word fill your heart. And I meet people all the time. I met one uh, young man this week who was terribly afraid. He came to me and he said, he ran to me and he said, I heard a sound in the closet. Of course, he's only six years old, and you expect that, you know. And it was just his sister in there playing with her Legos. But he thought it was a monster, you know. And I said, you know, don't be afraid. Now, if you are six and you hear sounds in the closet and you're afraid of the dark, that's normal. If you're 16, 26, 36, 46, 56, and upward, and still afraid, that's bad. Because the Lord says you are to be progressively, verse 8, letting his word richly dwell in you. So you are not afraid for your health. You are not afraid for your security. You're not afraid for the future. You're not afraid of attacks. You're not superstitious and afraid and living in constant fear. God says fear not. There's one solution for facing trouble. Take God with you. There's an antidote for fear. Experience God's presence. And Joshua cultivated that word-filled life. In fact, Turn back to Exodus 33. Let me show you how he got to be such a great hero. Exodus 33, you might want to mark this. Verse 11 is our first insight into Joshua's life. Joshua cultivated this word-filled life when he was earlier and younger, and he started to have it as a young man. It says in verse 11 of Exodus 33, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But look at Verse 11, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Now, you know what he had a habit as a young man? He loved to hang around and stay in the presence of God. Now, if you want a great habit as a young man or young woman, why don't you try that one? But Joshua was different. He didn't hang around with the crowd he, hang around, he hung around with his creator, with the Lord God of the universe. And that's, that was his habit. He started to have it when he was young. Joshua stayed on with the Lord. He loved to hang around the meeting place of the Lord. That was the, the representation of God's presence. Uh, what you could say is he, he loved to hang around, in our terminology, church, and he loved to hang around the fellowship of God's saints. That's what his habit was. So 
That's great. Now, back to Joshua 1. Here's a second habit. Look at Joshua 1 and verse 8. Turn from Exodus back to where we were. The second habit I see he cultivated is not only as a young man loving God's presence, but it says in verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. You know what he did? He obeyed that command. That was a command from the Lord. God says, I want you to let my word be in you so full it overflows. And he chose to do that. You know how I know that? Keep turning to chapter 24 of Joshua. This is one you'll see a lot of times in people's houses on little signs or needlepoint or something. But this is Joshua's testimony. He who made a habit as a young man to love God's presence, who obeyed God when he commanded him to meditate and love his word, look at Joshua 24, 15. He stuck with it to the end. And he says in verse 15, this is at the end of his life, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. One of the great verses in the Bible. Whether the gods your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my home, my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, you know why he could make that great majestic statement that we all love to put up on our walls? Because of the first two. Do you know why his family followed him following the Lord? Because he, as a young man, purposed that he was going to love God's presence, even to the neglect of of the crowd, and he was going to linger in God's presence. And then when God challenged him to let his word be in his heart and mind, he did it. And that's why he could stick to it to the end. He purposed that no matter what any other family on earth did, his was going to stay faithful to the Lord. And that resolve was only possible because he made the first two Well, the question that we should ask ourselves is, are we lingering in God's presence? Are we writing his word on our hearts so we don't fear? Are we going to someday be able to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord? You know, the most powerful form of leadership is not the leadership of position. You know, I'm the manager. I've got the position. It's not the leadership of expertise. I know more than everybody else. It's the leadership that is that is impossible not to be challenged by, and that's the leadership of character, of having a life that people want to follow. And that's what Joshua had. Well, the Lord says fearful times are coming. We shouldn't get swept up in the spirit of fear all around us. It's not from God. We need to remember and meditate on his promises. And for the next about three minutes, I want you to go into high gear with me. I'm going to just give you a series of verses that talk about not fearing. If you're not a memorizer, here are some good ones to, to memorize, okay? There are about seven of them. The first one's in Genesis 15. You can write them down, and I'm going to read them to you. Because it's just like our Lord to speak to us when we need him the most. His tender fear knots calm the storm in our hearts regardless of the circumstances. Genesis 15:1. he spoke to Abraham, and he said, do not be afraid, Abram, Genesis 15:1. I am your shield. I am your exceeding great reward. Eleven chapters later, Genesis 26, 24, I'll read that to you. He speaks to Isaac and he says, The Lord appeared to him the same night in Genesis 26, 24 and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear. Why? For I am with you. I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. 20 chapters later, Genesis 46 and verse 3, God spoke to Jacob. And this is what he says to Jacob in Genesis 46, 3. So he said, I am the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. God says, don't worry, I'm running this. Here's some more. Second Chronicles 20. In fact, I love this one. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 15. The Lord is speaking to uh, King Jehoshaphat. And this is what he says. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15, he said, Listen, all of you, Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, nor dismayed. You know what that word dismayed means? It means to fall apart. God says, don't fall apart. Don't, don't, when you see whatever it is that, that is your nemesis that you are prone to fear, don't focus on that and fall apart. He says, focus on me. And my promises. Meditate on my promises, not your problems. Do not be afraid or dismayed, verse 15 says, because of the great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. 
Verse 16, tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come by the ascent of Ziz, and you'll find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeriel. You will not need to fight in this battle, verse 17 says. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. And then he repeats it again. Don't fear or be dismayed, but tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Hey, hey. You might not be facing the Moabites, but fear stalks all of us. And God says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Here's another one, Daniel chapter 10. I love this one. Verse 12, uh, then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I've come. Verse 19 of Daniel 10, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Be strong. And so when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then here's another one. Look in the New Testament, uh, the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 30. I love having these all marked when fearful times come, whatever shape they take. Look at Luke 1, 30. It says this. Then the angel said to her, this is Mary now, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. You know what that word favor is? Grace. You've been begraced with grace. And all of us could say that this morning if you're saved. I have been begraced with God's grace. So I should not fear. Here's another one. Look at Luke 5.10. Just four chapters over. Look what Jesus said to Peter. Luke 5.10. And so also James and John, the sons of Debedee, who were partners, and Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. The book of Acts, the Lord said to Paul in Acts 27, 24, Don't be afraid, Paul. You'll be brought before Caesar, but God has granted to you all those who sail with you. That's when he was in the storm. And the next time we're afraid and fear comes over us and we feel alone and defeated, we need to meditate on these scriptures. And we need to claim by faith the presence of the Lord. Here's another one I I mentioned earlier. Hebrews 13, 5. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he said this, Conduct yourselves without covetous. Be content with what things you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Remember that's from Joshua 1. I will never leave you. And he doesn't change. He said, I was with you, Joshua. I'll never leave you. I'm right by you. I want you to experience my presence. When you feel my presence, you will not fear. And he told him that. And Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, whoever wrote it, said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Here's a, another one, Isaiah 41.10. These are just my favorite fear verses. Fear not, for I'm with you. You know, that fear not always comes with I'm with you. In fact, that's what I say to my kids, don't you? In the storms at night when they're, when they're not sure, I say, Daddy's here. Oh. It's so sweet. I love to see little Elizabeth, something she was troubled about the other night, and she just was all troubled. And I said, but I'm here. She went, oh. You could just see her go, oh. She just relaxed. Crawled back in that little tiny bed and pulled her little tiny blanket up and felt as secure as if she was in Fort Knox. She forgot Daddy was there. The Lord says, fear not, Isaiah 41.10. I'm with you. Be not dismayed. There's that same. Don't fall apart. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And here's the last one, Isaiah 43. And this one you ought to have big bright yellow on, verses 1 through 7. But now thus says the Lord who created you, he who formed you, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, They will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. The flame will not scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for your place. Since you are precious, verse 4, in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Verse 5, fear not. And always the, the caboose that's always on that. For I am with you. Verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. That's the promise of our God. He said, you want to make it in fearful times? Have a word-filled life. 
Let's do that. Let's bow before him this morning. Lord, I pray that if we're distracted, we remember Enoch and Noah and Abraham and have a word-filled life even when we're distracted with everything changing in our life. And if we're really busy and we're at the peak of our lives, help us to remember Moses who said, Lord, there's one thing I want, your presence. And he made that place and he met with you and he walked miles outside the camp to get alone with you. And then when we have fearful times, we would remember that fear is an opportunity for us to experience your presence as never before. Because when you tell us not to fear, you remind us, because I'm with you. I pray that each of us would know that you are with us, and we would let your word fill us in our fearful times. Because we love you, We belong to you because we trust you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's servants said, amen.